Volcanoes, let's talk about them. With our discussion of volcanoes, we're going to talk the general terms involved with volcanoes. We're going to look at the plumbing underground to create these volcanoes. Uh, we're going to discuss specifically the magma involved because there are different types of magma and different types of volcanic environments. And then we're going to talk about those volcanic environments, specifically the tectonic zones that produce volcanic eruptions. Uh, later, we'll talk about eruptive materials, uh, eruptions, and the different types and the different types of volcanic landforms that result, because different types of landforms result in different types of magmas and different types of eruptions. And then the hazards involved with volcanoes will give you some examples. So here we go, starting with volcano terms. First off, we've got magma, and that's the term used to describe any kind of molten rock. Uh, and uh, melted uh, minerals and crystals, uh, all of them in a melt, uh, gases, dissolved gases, that's magma. And that's what we, the term we use to describe um, molten rock underground. When rock is at or near the Earth's surface, we call it lava, uh, but it's the same stuff. Magma and lava are the same thing. And then the actual opening of the earth of where the stuff comes out, that's called the vent, the volcanic vent. All right, so you often hear me, hear me use the term magma, but know that if it's at or near the earth's surface, uh, lava can also, uh, can also and probably should be used. Um, of course, we hear a lot about lava in, in Hawaii because uh, a lot of that, uh, volcanic activity is taking place in Hawaii and they see lava on the surface. So. Lava creates lots of different rocks, but that's the, the general gist there. The term volcano then is what they describe as the materials that build up around the vent of the volcano. And of course, the more erupted material, the larger the volcano. There are different types of volcanoes we're gonna talk about that build up. A crater is a leftover divot from an eruption. Once you get the volcano built up, uh, there used to typically magma will pool up underground. And when it erupts, uh, the magma comes on the surface and it leaves a space inside the earth. And that space drops down, typically gives you a little bit of a crater at the top of volcanoes. And caldera is a term used to describe a large crater. Okay, so you see pictured here a caldera, uh, actually, and then a um, a smaller volcano near uh, in and inside the caldera with a crater on top of it. And we'll talk about each of those. What creates volcanoes? Well, magma and magma has certain plumbing that goes on underneath the surface. So let's talk about the plumbing of volcanoes. First off, there's a term called pluton, and a pluton is just a, a blob of rising magma. As magma rises through the crust, it kind of burns a path through the crust, often taking a path of least resistance through the rock. Perhaps there's a rock that melts easier than others. Perhaps there's uh, some fractures in the rocks, but magma will typically follow these. Excuse me. And so plutons are blobs, and there are different types of plutons. There are sills, which are thin layers uh, between rock layers. So magma will burn its way in between rock layers, maybe burn out that uh, layer that's weaker or easily more easily melted. Lacoliths are where magma kind of pushes its way in between layers and, and rises or raises the layers above it up, create kind of a little bit of a dome above it. We talked about dome mountains, oftentimes formed by lacoliths. I remember the Black Hills and the Adirondack Mountains. And then dikes are intrusions of angled, uh, through angled fractures. And that's the term we use to describe any kind of magma that's burning its way through uh, weaker fractures or, or existing fractures in the rocks, sometimes even fault lines. And these are plutons, rising blobs of magma that burn their way through the Earth's crust. One more term, and that is batholith. A uh, batholith is different than a pluton in that it is a huge, massive pocket of magma below the Earth's surface. Okay, so batholith 
are greater than 100 square miles. They're larger than plutons. Typically, they're the main source of magma that, that rises up to form plutons. Uh, batholiths oftentimes, through erosion, reach the surface. And so we can see these beautiful rock formations of igneous rocks. You see one pictured here. Oftentimes in mountains, in a mountain building, you'll see uh, areas of, of batholiths. So let's talk about the magma. First off, how does magma get created? Well, obviously melting, heat produces melting. As you get down deeper in the earth, about 100 meters down, the temperature can get up to um, over 1,000 degrees C. And so melting, of course, occurs in some of the rocks that um, have lower melting points, some of the crystals, rock crystals that have lower melting points. So as that heated magma rises through the crust, believe it or not, um, it brings that heat um, up more. And as it, re as it comes up more, there's less rock pushing down on it. There's less pressure. And so there's a thing called decompression melting, where when rock, hot rock, begins uh, uh, kind of migrating upward due to its lower density, uh, it'll actually melt the surrounding rock as it moves upward. And this is called decompression melting. So heat can cause magnetic form, so can uh, reduce pressure. <clears throat> and then water. As the magma rises through the crust, it also encounters areas of water. Uh, groundwater uh, can help melting the melting process. And then it's of note that when tectonic plates subduct at those subduction zones, the, di the plate diving down into the mantle is waterlogged. It's been at the bottom of the ocean. And so that introduction of water to the mix of hot, hot um, environment in the lower mantle or, or sorry, in the lower crust and um, lithosphere, produces melting at a, a greater rate. And then when rocks with, with water in them melt, they're charged with that water vapor gas. The, the water turns into water vapor and uh, produces a, a lot of gas in the magma. So typically at subduction zones, you have gas-charged magma that bo buoyantly rises through the crust when it erupts, it explodes because that's trapped gas under pressure. <clears throat> Over 50% of the gases in volcano and volcanic eruptions are water vapor. So this shows a subducting slab, a zone of water release and heat produces magma where it forms and it migrates up as plutons and creates plutons as it rises through. And of course, the buoyancy of that water vapor makes it get and reach the surface. There are a couple or a few different kinds of magma. There is so called basaltic magma. And basaltic magma is usually dark colored because it's high in iron and magnesium. It's metal rich magma. It's more dense because it comes from deeper in the mantle. Basaltic magma is mantle magma. As a result, it doesn't have a lot of that water vapor. It was not created from any kind of crustal melting. So uh, it doesn't have a lot of gas in it. And the gases that is, are in it escape easily because the magma is pretty runny. There's a term called viscosity, and viscosity refers to the thickness of a magma. If a uh, magma has a lot of viscosity, high viscosity, it's very thick. If it has a low viscosity, it's very thin. And basaltic magma, low viscosity, it's very thin. It's thin, it's hot, it's runny, it comes directly from the mantle. It's dense, high in iron and magnesium. This is the stuff that paves the ocean floor. And actually, uh, the, the rock that's harvested, um, to create the road, our roadways, our asphalt, uh, those are actually uh, basalt pebbles. Yeah, 
Yeah, so, right. So do you see this woman in the picture here? She's uh, uh, showing a pic, uh, picture, or she's probably photographing a man, uh, the, ma the lava flow here. First of all, it's really hard to get pretty close because this magma, or sorry, this lava is like 1300 degrees C. I mean, basaltic magma is hotter than the other types of magma. So you can't get too close. And secondly, um, it does it does run. Maybe melted ice cream would be a good analogy to how fast this magma, how liquidy this magma is. So if it comes in volume, yeah, and it's coming at a great speed, uh, the greatest speed would be probably fast as fast as you can walk. So it's probably not super dangerous as far as, but there has been some killer events. There was one killer event in uh, 2002 where uh, the lava flow uh, came through a refugee camp. There was a civil war in Rwanda and there were some refugees, in Zaire, I believe, and a lava flow came down the mountain from a volcano and it, it trapped a bunch of people and, and killed, I think, like uh, maybe around 100 or so of the people. Uh, because of its uh, fast-moving nature, and people just couldn't get out of the way. So, so there are rare events where this can be a thing. Rhyolitic magma is the second type of magma, and it is lower in density. It is rich in silica, and it comes from melted crust. It doesn't have as much iron and magnesium in it, so it's lighter in color. It has more uh, elements like silica and potassium and aluminum and calcium. And so the minerals that are made are feldspars and quartz. They're pink and white and clear. There's also some black minerals that it makes, but they're more like flecks peppered within. If you've seen granite countertops, for example, you've seen a the result of a rhyolitic uh, magma cooling at a very slow rate. Uh, rhyolitic magma is also called granitic magma in your textbook, and it forms granite uh, when it has a chance to cool off slowly. Rhyolitic magma is sticky. It is more viscous, so it's thicker. It, it has more gas in it typically because it comes from that melted crust. So it can, it's very explosive. Okay. Whereas basaltic magma would be about the consistency of melted ice cream, rhyolitic magma would be like syrup or molasses in its consistency, even thicker in a lot of cases. You can use the term viscosity to refer to rocks as well. I've talked to you about how the rocks, quote unquote, flow in the asthenosphere. Uh, they're not melted completely. They're heated up at a, at a great rate. And some rocks are more buoyant. They're just less dense than others. So even in a rock environment, rock will actually rise up through other rocks. And this convection is what helps cause that movement in plate tectonics. So you don't think of rocks as viscous or being able to flow, quote unquote, flow, but they kind of do. And um, we also don't think of rocks as being elastic, but they are. And that's what causes that earthquake uh, release, that release of elastic energy when rocks snap along fault lines. That's when they're colder or near the surface. They're less tendent, they have a less tendency to flow and more tendency to bend and break because of the cooler temperatures and less overlying pressure. So basaltic magma and rhyolitic magma. I do want to mention that there is a intermediate of these two, basaltic magma and rhyolitic magma are kind of the extremes. There is another one in between them. It's called andesitic magma. And andesitic magma, you might want to write, jot that down, andesitic magma, like the Andes Mountains. It's actually named after that. Andesitic magma is very common along subduction zones. And those are what, that's where we get our big explosive volcanoes, andesitic magma, A-N-D-E-S. IT, IC, andesitic magma. It's an intermediate variety of the two, intermediate style magma. It's directly from melted crust. 
It is more explosive. It's very similar into what you uh, to what you see here in rhyolitic magma. And it is typically found in the explosive volcano. So each of these magmas is actually found in tectonic zones. We talked about this already, that subduction zones are a main source of magma and eventual volcanoes. Subduction zones occur at plate boundaries, or excuse me, convergent plate boundaries. And as the crust, which is usually ocean crust, it's, it's more waterlogged. It dives into the mantle of these subduction zones. And again, when it gets deeper in the earth, it hits that heat. And water mixing with heated uh, crust makes it melt easier. And it forms that andesitic magma. Andesitic magma, as it burns through the crust, picks up more silica. It could become rhyolitic magma. Okay, so andesitic helps rhyolitic. Any, any kind of magma that burns through a lot of continental crust turns rhyolitic because it gathers a lot of silica through the, as it melts through the continental crust. So lots of silica, lots of water, andesitic and rhyolitic magmas, they form explosive volcanoes. And the explosive type of volcanoes are called stratovolcanoes. All the volcanoes that, are, that form along um, Subduction zones are stratovolcanoes, and we'll talk more about those as we talk about types of volcanoes next time. Two types of volcanoes form at subduction zones. Really, the same kinds of volcanoes, just one form on the continents and one form from uh, un underneath the water. The ones that form along the edges of continents, those are called volcanic arc volcanoes, a volcanic arc volcanoes. I have a picture along South American coastline there and the Andes Mountains are an example. All of those mountains are formed because there's a subduction of the Nazca plate underneath the South American plate. And that subduction zone, that oceanic crust diving underneath the continental crust produces Explosive volcanoes along the coastline. Explosive volcanoes along coastlines are called volcanic arc, oceanic continental convergence, volcanic arcs. Now, the picture in the lower right, I believe that's in Colombia, but I'm not entirely certain on that. Um, I couldn't find the, uh, the actual location of that to confirm it, but I thought it was such a cool picture. I wanted to include it. It kind of outlines the fact that these volcanoes occur on coastlines. The second type of volcano that occurs, the second type of volcanic zone that occurs because of subduction zones are called island arc volcanoes. Island arc volcanoes. And these are oceanic, oceanic convergences where one ocean plate dives underneath another ocean plate and produces volcanoes that pop up from below the water surface to form island arc volcanoes. So they're islands, and they usually form in the arc in the form of an arc. So they call them island arc volcanoes. Japan is a as a great example. Japan is an arcing set of uh, islands formed from volcanic eruptions. There are many volcanoes along Japan's coastlines and in the center of Japan. And Japan is basically one big arc of volcanoes. <clears throat> Mount Fuji is among one of the largest and uh, very explosive volcanoes, and you see that picture in the lower right. That's Mount Fujiyama in Japan. And you can see in the picture, the tectonics behind this is the Pacific plate and the Philippine plate are being subducted underneath the Eurasian plate here to form the uh, Japan Japanese islands. And you can see it further north even, there's a North American plate um, uh, soliciting subduction as well. Island arc volcanoes. What was the last one called? 
volcanic arc volcanoes. Those are ones that occur along the coastline due to subduction zones. The ones that occur and create islands due to subduction zones, island arc. So these are kind of the two major zones where explosive volcanoes form. So you might want to make note in your notes, explosive volcanoes. Andesitic magmas. Andesitic and rhyolitic magmas. Explosive volcanoes. In fact, because of all the subduction that's taking place around the Pacific Ocean, they call that area the Ring of Fire. The Ring of Fire surrounding the Pacific Ocean, the ring of volcanoes that surrounds the Pacific Ocean, the Ring of Fire. So much subduction takes place that there's ample volcanoes around all the continental coastlines or volcanic arc volcanoes. And there are also lots of island arc volcanoes, specifically um, along the uh, west coast of the Pacific there, uh, the Aleutian Islands of Alaska, Japan, we just talked about the Philippines, uh, Indonesia is thrown in there, even though it's from a different um, suite, uh, and then the New Zealand Islands, New Guinea, the Ring of Fire, island arc volcanoes in the west, typically, and volcanic arc uh, volcanoes in the east Pacific, Pacific Ring of Fire. We can't forget mid-ocean ridges formed at divergent boundaries. Mid-ocean ridge volcanoes are probably the most abundant on the Earth's surface. Even though we have that big Pacific Ring of Fire and there's lots of explosive volcanoes there, these non-explosive volcanoes that occur at divergent boundaries are probably more active and more numerous on the Earth's surface. In fact, they are. Of course, the Mid-Atlantic Ridge is an example of this. Iceland is one example that's above the air surface. You're seeing a picture on the lower left from Iceland and then the lower right as well. This magma is not from melted crust. This magma is from deeper in the mantle and it rises up to the Earth's surface and splits apart uh, the ocean crust. And so driving apart the tectonic plates at divergent boundaries is this rising basaltic magma. It's hot, it's runny, it's high in iron and magnesium. It ends up forming thin, dense ocean crust and it sinks low in the mantle and therefore that's why it's called ocean crust because it's usually found under the ocean and paving the ocean floor. Iceland is a, is a um, exception because there's a lot of basaltic magma coming out of there in a very short amount of short amount of geologic time to form a big island there. Uh, divergent boundaries and their accompanying basaltic magma often form their magma is so runny that they don't form tall volcanoes, they form these big large volcanic plateaus. Okay, and they're layer upon layer of basaltic magma. It's really runny, so it runs out in, in a flatter area. And um, Iceland could kind of be referred to as a volcanic plateau. Uh, areas where lots of basaltic magma pours out on the Earth's surface are called flood basalts because basalt is flooding onto the Earth's surface. And Iceland is a small example. There's actually bigger areas of flood basalt. Uh, the Columbia River flood basalts in Washington State in our country. There's one called the Deccan Traps in India. Uh, the Siberian Traps in uh, northern parts of Russia, all big, huge plateaus of basaltic magma. Yes. What type of volcano would be the Yellowstone volcano? Great question. Those are hot spots, and that's our last type of environment. Our last type of volcanic environment are hot spots. Heat builds up under one isolated pocket of magma coming from the mantle. A big blob of magma constantly fed by the deep mantle, producing millions and tens of millions and hundreds of millions of years of eruptions, hotspot. Of course, Hawaii is our prime example of this environment. 
There's a large hotspot underneath the large island of Hawaii. But that hotspot has been feeding volcanic activity on the Pacific Plate for hundreds of millions of years. So as the Pacific Plate has drifted northward and now northwestward, northwestward over that hotspot, we have volcanic chains of islands that reach from the large island of Hawaii all the way northwest to the Emperor Seamounts and the Midway Islands. Further north, as we go all the way up to the Aleutian Islands, you can track the hotspot activity from Hawaii. And perhaps an even more inf infamous hotspot would be the one underneath Yellowstone National Park, which sits in the northwest uh, corner of Wyoming. And right where Idaho and Montana and Wyoming meet, there's a huge magma pocket being fed by a uh, rising basaltic magma on the lower mantle. As it melts through the continental crust, it picks up so much silica. By the time it reaches the Earth's surface, it is thick, sticky granitic magma. Thick, sticky uh, rhyolitic magma. And as a result, that thick, sticky magma and the, enormity, the enormous nature of this magma pocket produces a volcanic super eruption, a catastrophic type of eruption called Ultra Plinian that. Uh, can actually cause the in, the last time it erupted. In fact, it uh, covered the entire western half of the United States in ash. Everything west of the Mississippi, the Yellowstone Caldera, it's called because it's such a huge crater that's dropped down from the past eruptions, is 26 miles wide, and it erupts every 600,000 years. The last time it erupted, 600,000 years ago. So there is activity under Yellowstone, and they would expect it to erupt any time in the near geologic uh, uh, in the near geologic uh, uh, current currently, right? In the near, in the near future, um, there is surging of that magma pocket, producing producing frequent earthquakes. There's of course heated groundwater to produce geysers and hot springs. So Yellowstone. Is a, a continental hotspot. Hawaii is a um, oceanic hotspot. But both of them are examples of the last tectonic environment hotspot. So we had volcanic arc volcanoes, island arc volcanoes, divergent boundary volcanoes, and hotspot volcanoes. Yes. Question, Ian. The near geologic future means tomorrow or 10,000 years. Absolutely. Yep. So uh, when you're talking, talking in terms of geologic time, it's bigger spans of time than, of course, our, our lifetime is referred to in. Mm -hmm. Good point. Okay. When you pair our different environments of volcanoes with the different types of magma, I just wanted to give you a visual of this. Before we end this discussion here, you can see on the far left volcanic volcanoes occur from melted ocean crust diving into the mantle. And that melted crust rises to the surface, producing typically andesitic magmas. But you can have anywhere on the spectrum from of uh, slightly basaltic to slightly rhyolitic magmas on the volcanic arcs and these island arcs. Um, ocean islands, that's referring to your uh, hot spots, so typically basaltic lavas near hot spots. Uh, Hawaii is an example. You see lots of basaltic magma, basaltic lava that erupts from there. And then basaltic lavas uh, operate at the mid ocean ridges. Okay? So if we're going to quantify volcanoes, the most uh, volcanoes on the Earth's surface are divergent boundary volcanoes. They're the most peaceful erupting. There are hot spot volcanoes, of course. And then there are island arc and volcanic arc that form above subduction zones. Those are less in number, but more explosive. Lastly, today, erupted materials. Lava flows are one example of erupted materials. Since lava flows are so common in Hawaii, 
They were actually named with Hawaiian names. Two types of lava flows. A slowly cooling lava flow is called pahoe hoe. It's smooth and ropey. It's a fun word to say. And then ones that the lava flows that cool a little more quickly cool in a rough, jagged form, and they're called a a. And a great way to tell the difference between pahoe hoe and a a is that when you walk over pahoe hoe, it's nice and smooth and ropey. But when you walk over a a, you're like ah 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 because it's so rough and jagged. And then those frequently erupting volcanoes underneath the water in the in diverged boundaries, they produce oftentimes called these rounded, these rounded blobs of lava. Because it's so cold in the deep ocean environment, uh, the, the lava comes up and it forms these uh, bubbles called pillow lava. So they're called pillow basalts or pillow lava. And that's typically a uh, deposit we see of magma that's risen to the surface, cooled as lava flow. And under the fierce uh, waters. Okay, so the hoi hoi ah, ah, and pillow lava are lava flows. And of course, there are uh, volcanic materials from erupt large eruptions. These are called pyroclasts. The word pyro means fire, and class means rock, fire rock, or pyroclast. There are two types of pyroclasts. There's tephra, which is the small stuff, volcanic dust, volcanic ash. And then larger pyroclasts, lapilli, which are like fish tank rocks, pebbles. Volcanic bombs, which are like baseballs. When a volcano erupts, uh, it actually sends blobs of magma flying through the air. They actually can cool as they fly through the air and they cool like a baseball with a tail. Uh, that would be like a volcanic bomb. And then volcanic blocks are the big stuff, the big blobs that cool. And some of the, the broken pieces of volcano top when the thing blows. You're seeing a pyroclastic cloud. We'll talk about that when we talk about volcanic hazards. It is a big killer when it comes to volcanic eruption. So pyroclast in the form of tephra or pyroclast, small stuff versus the bigger stuff. And here's a picture of each. Volcanic blocks and volcanic bombs, and lapilli, the pyroclast, and volcanic dust and ash here as an example of these visually. Well, that's it for today. I don't want to go any further, obviously. We don't have enough time, and uh, eruptions, landforms, and hazards are their own thing. Uh, so we'll talk about those next time. Thanks for listening. Uh, we talked. Volcanic terms like magma and lava, volcano and vent. We talked magma, basaltic, and acidic and rhyolitic, tectonic zones, divergent boundaries, hot spots, and of course, subduction zones produce volcanic arcs and island arcs. And then erupted materials, lava flows, bahoi hoi, ah ah, hello. And we talked uh, pyroclast and tephra. Tephra is the small stuff, pyroclast is the bigger stuff. We'll talk about eruptions, landforms, and hazards next time.